Um, I'm really happy to be here to get today. Um, Simon and I are bringing our decades of combined experience from the automotive industry into Ox Delivers, a, a startup that is focused on the untapped market of over 3 billion people that lack access to motorised transport. As we make our transition from fossil fuels to EVs, have you stopped to consider where those old vehicles are going? As these vehicles become unpopular, as these di diesel and petrol vehicles become unpopular, they don't go to scrap, they are exported, predominantly to countries in the global south. Africa's roads are full of our used vehicles. In fact, 85% of vehicles on the roads in Africa are our used vehicles, predominantly from U Europe and the US. And as we shed our old polluting vehicles, Africa buys them. And then what happens? Well, they're run on dirt roads. They're using poor fuel quality. And low incomes means little to no maintenance. No MOT requirements means that emissions go unchecked. So emissions explode. In fact, they become three times more polluting. Only five markets in Africa have regulations in place. The, the highest of that is EU4. The lowest is EU2. EU2 is what we had in the UK 30 years ago. And these cheap vehicles provide a quick fix solution, but they're also compounding the climate change. Half of Africa's population today are children. And so, over the next 30 years, Africa will become the fastest growing continent, which means food demand will double from what, what it is today. And food productivity needs to increase dramatically. And so that can't be done using transportation such as bicycles that you see on the screen or using our second-hand vehicles, because as I said, that will be an environmental disaster. So we need to find a solution that works not just for the wealthy markets, but for everybody. Because right now, even though demand is high for transport, automotive manufacturers often overlook markets where there's no new vehicle sales or, or little new vehicle sales, because many people can't afford to buy new vehicles. And this isn't a new issue. This is a cycle. It's a really bad transport cycle. But the good news is that we have an opportunity in emerging markets. We don't have the infrastructure and the businesses built over 100 years of oil domination that force us down the same routes as we use in the West. And so our belief is that Af Africa can actually lead the way in electrification. It can be first, not last, to go to clean vehicles. But to do so, we need to innovate. We need to do things differently to what we do here in the West. So what we're doing, and this is where Ox Delivers comes in, what we're doing is building a revolutionary technology-enabled transport solution that's affordable, that's reliable, that's profitable, and obviously carbon zero. We're affordable because we don't sell vehicles, we don't rent vehicles. What we do is we sell transport. We sell transport as a service, because that brings the price down from thousands of dollars to buy a truck or hundreds of dollars to rent a truck to as little as a single dollar to move a sack of goods from A to B. We're reliable because we're building our own vehicle, which is designed for the dirt roads of Africa. We can't wait to pave all the roads. We have to find a clean solution that works now. And it's profitable because when you move goods, you make money. A valuable di a diamond that I have is worthless to you until I physically give it to you. That's the same as with agricultural crops or any goods. When you deliver it to a market, you create value. And therefore, that creates value for our customers. They make money. And it creates value for us. We make money. And then finally, we're zero carbon because we use electric trucks. And the great thing about a servitized transport as a service model is it actually aligns the needs of our customers, which is being cheap, with our needs, which is spending less money on energy and maintenance. Now, 
What that looks like from the customer con side is really quite simple. We, our, our drivers are also our um, outreach team, they're our marketing team, so they go out, the best advertisement for transport is a moving truck. Um, once people know about us, they use uh, their phone, they'll either ring us up or use a 2G mobile app to book space on the truck. The driver comes and collects it. Because we sell a part load, we go and find other demand to fill the rest of the truck. And then the goods are delivered. And then we pay using Momo. The, the customer pays using Momo, which is a type of banking that we run on a 2G phone. It's much easier and more effective than what we use here. And, and mobile banking is a good example of where Africa has leapfrogged ban branch banking going straight to a mobile solution, just like this. Now, to run a logistics business, you need three components. You need a truck, you need drivers, and you need a digital platform. And we're building those for this solution to deliver a zero carbon transport system. So this is our uh, electric truck, uh, backed by the Advanced Propulsion Center and Innovate UK, who are both exhibiting here. They've given us 21 million pounds in grant projects over the last couple of years. And it's the first purpose-built electric truck for emerging markets. This is Fleury, one of our Drivers Plus, one of the first people we hired in Rwanda two years ago. Uh, he's now one of our depot managers because we have a team of about 70 people delivering services in Rwanda today. And we call them Drivers Plus because they don't just drive. They also do our sales, they do the customer care, they do the maintenance, and they look after the vehicles. Um, and it's not just us that thinks it's a neat idea. T Time magazine uh, labeled us as one of their innovations of 2022 last year um, because we're building a system that will enable Africa to move away from using bicycles, which is the dominant solution in Rwanda, to building a productive but clean transport system that drives productivity. And therefore, that means it drives economic growth, it drives social impact, and it drives climate change. Um, uh, and finally, we are going crowdfunding, so uh, you too can join us on this journey. We're selling equity. If you put the QR code in, you can get early access to our uh, campaign, which will open in a couple of weeks. Um, I'm happy to take questions now. Um, if you don't have a chance to do that, we have a stand uh, on just off the main area right next to Nat West, who will give you a free coffee or a free drink, um, and then you can come and talk to us. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Yes. Any questions from the audience? You can raise your hand and I'll hand the mic to you. Um, do you produce these uh, vehicles yourself and yeah. will you only use them <clears throat> for your own business? Um, yes, we produce them ourselves. So it's a flat pack truck, a bit like IKEA. So we will build the kits in the UK and then we'll assemble them locally. Um, we use them for all our local operations around the, the rural areas. We do use other people's trucks for some long haul transport because they run on roads. We can use Western electric trucks. There's no need to innovate there. Um, will we use them for other people? Yes, in a few years. The reason being is when you build a truck for a servitized system, you think about it very, very differently to when you build a truck for sale because you're interested in total life cost, how you maintain it, how you uh, keep it running. Uh, whereas when you build a truck for sale, you care about how cheap it is because that's how you make your margin. So there's a direct conflict. So what will happen is in future, we'll sell to fleets and other people who are looking at lifetime cost. We won't ever do a retail model like you might with a Hilux or a Transit. One question there and coming. No. There you go. <laughs> I really, really can't like focus. Hi, uh, my name is Bahaj. I'm from the University of Southampton. Um, really interesting project. Um, in Africa, there's already developed supply chain for this type of transportation of goods, in addition to bikes. So how are you going to do, wh what is this technology going to do to those people who are living on those type of old technologies that are, you know, bad and polluting? And the second, then how many vehicles have you sold so far? Well, we've sold no vehicles because we don't sell vehicles. So um, we do, we do two. How many did you supply to Africa then? Okay. 
So um, what we're doing at the moment is we're developing our technology and our business model in parallel. So we run an operation in Rwanda today, which has got about 20 trucks running. They're conventional diesel trucks. The reason being is from the client's point of view, what fuel you put in the truck doesn't make a big difference. It makes a difference to us because how much we spend on maintenance, how much you spend on fuel. So our revenue is about $100,000 a month at the moment off those 20 trucks. And so that is, from our point of view, proving that there is demand. Right? And some of our customers are saying, you know, we had a pineapple customer who increased their, quintupled their operations since working with us. That's a five-fold increase in productivity because they've got transport that's reliable. Um, I, did that answer your first question? I'm not sure. So, you can talk to me afterwards. Any other questions? Hi, uh, yeah, I was just wondering how you go about the actual charging infrastructure. How do you go about like charging your fleet of, of, of EV vehicles? Can we take this? Um, is it, do you want to do that? Yeah, I'll, I'll take this one. I, um, sorry, the noise from back there is really yeah. difficult. You can't quite hear. Um, so the charging infrastructure is actually much simpler in a logistics operation than it is if you were to think of, say, personal ownership of an EV because we're operating from a depot. So the truck starts and ends its day in the same location every day. And because it's a logistics operation, we know exactly how far it's going, we know where it's going. So it can be charged at the depot. Now our first market, Rwanda, the grid is, is pretty great um, there actually. And we, we don't see a, a major obstacle to accessing that. At some point we will find an obstacle to accessing the grid um, in different markets and maybe in Rwanda at points. And, and we know that we offer an incredible anchor demand to energy suppliers that want to provide energy into an off-grid location. So if you think of a solar mini-grid, for example, if they're coming to a location that doesn't have energy at the moment, there's, there's not naturally demand there, but we would be able to offer that demand straight away. So, so charging is, is much simpler than you might think because I guess we all come at it from a, we expect to be able to drive wherever we need to in our personal vehicle. Um, this, is, this is very different. So logistics operation is the perfect situation for EV operation. I, I've got another question here. Um, the market in Africa is, is perhaps much more aligned to a two-wheeler and have you actually thought that at, at actually approaching your converting the technology that you have here for a two-wheeler type transportation system? So you, yeah. you're right. You're right. Two-wheelers are predominant in Africa um, or in lots of African markets. But when you go rurally, where you're getting to very bad roads and very poor infrastructure, um, and to move and to transport goods, you need a truck. So two wheels are great in an urban application um, and they have really shown how how fantastic they can be and how useful to economies they can be but once you get to a rural rural application that's where you need to think differently is there anything yeah. to add to that yeah we we know very well some of the founders of the electric vehicle companies in you know in rwanda and in kenya that there's a lot of success there and it, it's a great example of where you go i guess a two-ton truck carries a lot more stuff than a, bike, than a motorbike. You know, maybe you get 100 kilos on the back of a bike. So it's about productivity. And I, yeah, you, you can't make a whole continent move just on two wheels. We, we are looking at other, other vehicles. So we're talking about looking at smaller vehicles, you know, for around towns and stuff like that. So tricycles potentially is one of the things that we will explore because it's obviously you need multimodal solutions, right? This is, this is a two ton truck. So it's about the same size as a Hilux, but a lot more capacity, which works well for local agricultural products, delivery around a region, goods to and from market, that sort of thing. For other applications, longer haul, shorter haul, you, you use different modes. Um, but this is, I guess, our argument would be there's a big gap in the four wheel segment, partly because it's expensive to, to develop trucks. And so, and car makers just aren't interested in the continent because there's just, just not enough sales. Even Toyota as a market leader sells tiny numbers of vehicles in proportion to the number of people. Like there's something like 15,000 pickup trucks in Rwanda for, for 13 million people. It's, it's bonkers ratios. Very well. I, this lady keeps putting her hand up uh, from the I'm start. So, can so we... sorry, I, I missed you. 
we, we are... I'm going to let a cue jump. We now, are... Because she was right finished at the time, but if it's a, a quick question... Thank you. Actually, one of my questions was answered, but I have a new oh, one. Okay. <laughs> but I have a new one. Um, yeah, I was wondering, I'm not an expert like technology of cars, but I know one of the challenges in uh, sustainability and like moving to EV cars is actually like producing a new car like it's a lot of emissions right we don't want to just like be in the old engine cars yeah. we also want to like think and how potentially use them so like have you considered like yeah, adjusting the you know the diesel cars to ev or or not necessary uh, can, can i split the answer into two parts right so one of the great things about servitization is it forces you to think about the life cycle of a vehicle right as a say as a car manufacturer that was where we used to work you, you're about selling cars to the first owner who gives a monkeys what happens on owner number 27 they're the ones who have to scrap it the only thing you can do then is regulation whereas as an operator right you want to keep your vehicles going forever like, so we very much think of the vehicle kind of like you'd build software made up of lots of components. And so we don't, we don't ever want an ox truck to die. We just keep replacing parts. So from a circularity point of view, you can do a lot when you're a service business. Um, conversion is an interesting idea. Lots of people want it. I personally don't think it works because the way cars are developed, the electronic components of it, if you pull an engine out of a car and put an EV in, you'll find problems like when you turn it on, it won't go because it expects to see a signal from a, um, the, the rev counter because that's how an ordinary car knows it works. So I remember at Jaguar Land Rover when we did our first ever hybrid, the number of problems you found just because the engine would be off and the car would be moving was not something that had ever been considered. Cause when the en so engine on was used as a proxy for car is moving by lots of systems in the car. So if you want to convert a car to EV, you're effectively going to have to replace every bit of electronics in the vehicle, you know. So it's maybe possible, but I've yet to see an economically viable decision. Just just recycle the car; they're very recyclable, and build a new one that's designed for electric. Very well. Thank you very much for the presentation. We are running out of time. Apologies for the uh, slow delay. So we're going to take a three minutes break and then talk about free and the open emissions data. Thank you very much for the presentation and for the attendance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Come and see us afterwards.